the people have registered. Uh, we have three very ex very interesting presentations. Uh, first up, we will hear uh, from Tom Dennis from Waters. Uh, Waveswell Energy Limited, who have developed a unique technology that converts the energy in ocean waves into electricity. Uh, his presentation will describe the technology, its potential, the company's current project at King Island in Bass Strait, and the various applications of this of the technology, including its abil ability to double as part of a breakwater or seawall, thereby providing protection against cost coastal erosion and or a safe harbor harbor facility. Uh, he will be followed by Francois Flocard from Marine Renewable Energies. And last but least, least uh, Christophe Gordon will talk on offshore energy and opportunities. I hope you enjoy the presentations. Tom? Okay. Thank you. And uh, okay, yep, there's, uh, there's the screen. Thanks everyone for uh, taking an interest in uh, all of our presentations and uh, including my, my own. Um, so uh, I just I guess I'll need um, someone to move on the slides when when required. So if we could go to the next one. Yep, that, that's great. Um, Waveswell Energy itself is a public unlisted company, an Australian public unlisted company. It was, we were founded in 2016 to commercialise the unidirectional oscillating water column technology that we developed. Now, uh, for those who may be familiar with wave energy, um, oscillating water columns are one of the most, uh, the more common uh, and developed forms, but they've always been bidirectional, and that means um, with a turbine that uh, sees air flowing from both directions, well, from two directions on the up stroke of the wave and on the downstroke. Uh, whereas we've now moved to a unidirectional uh, OWC, which only develops uh, energy on the downstroke. But I'll talk more about the technology in the next slide. Um, Wavesoil itself owns all of the intellectual property. It's not licensed from anyone else, and uh, that and therefore it's it's owned by the shareholders themselves. Uh, just so that you're aware too, the the the, di uh, the photographs in the background uh, generally from the um, from our uh, King Island unit, which I'll describe in a little more detail uh, in a few slides time. So uh, next slide. Yeah, the technology itself, uh, as I uh, noted, it's um, a unidirectional oscillating water column, which is unique in the field of, um, of OWCs and therefore wave energy. Um, what happens is for those, well, firstly, if you're not familiar with what an, an oscillating water column is, it's like a big artificial blowhole. It, um, it's like an, uh, an artificial uh, cave that, or, or chamber that's open underneath the water and has a small opening above the water. And uh, what happens is as the waves move by, it causes the water inside the, the, the cavern or cave to uh, rise and fall inside the chamber. And that um, pushes or uh, displaces air above to begin with, and then sucks it back in as the as the um, water level falls. Um, what we do uh, that's different is on the upstroke as the wave as the water level inside the chamber is rising, uh, it um, is vented. That air above is now vented to the atmosphere through some very simple flinge, uh, hinged flaps. Um, and then uh, as the water level starts to fall, those flaps naturally are, are sucked closed and the, the only way the air can come back in is via the turbine and that's what generates the electricity. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very quite a, an efficient method of, uh, of extracting energy from um, ocean waves. It's also very survivable because it's just a big chunk of concrete in relatively shallow water. Uh, and very accessible due to it being in shallow water and therefore close to shore. And uh, importantly, there are no moving parts whatsoever in, in the water. So that means that anything that does need any, um, any maintenance or um, attention is, uh, is all up you know, several metres above the water line. So there's no need for anyone to get wet. Um, it acts as an artificial reef and a form of coastal protection, which I'll um, elaborate on later. Um, and because of that, because it can 
act as a seawall. Um, it offers benefits both as a climate change mitigation measure, which uh, in, in other words, it uh, reduces the emissions of CO2, but also as a climate change adaptation measure, helping to alleviate coastal er erosion from uh, inevitable um, extreme events and sea level rise from climate change. So next slide. Um, waves can provide, uh, basically, the, this is the waves that we see breaking on the coastlines of the world. It can provide uh, roughly twice the world's current energy usage. Uh, no one's actually proposing that that will be the uh, the only source of power in the future, but it just gives you a sense of the um, of the resource. Uh, it, wave energy is regarded as complementary base load power, and the reason for that is it's much more well, it's it's highly predictable out several days uh, with great accuracy, and you know even up to a week, which allows it to allows, for example, um, existing coal-fired power, which is very slow to react to to increase or decrease its output. Uh, it it can easily adapt within the timeframes of variability of wave energy, whereas that's not always the case with some of the other renewables. Solar power, for example, could be uh, churning out um, uh, heaps of power at its maximum and then a cloud comes over the sun and then suddenly it drops. So, um, you know, within a few seconds and certainly uh, existing baseload power can't cope with that short time frame of variation. So yes, waves are the most reliable, consistent and predictable of the renewable energy sources. Um, and when they're uh, used in conjunction with wind and solar, that additional diversity helps to enhance the grid. Uh, next slide. The applications, and they, this isn't necessarily unique to our technology, but um, uh, the applications besides large scale grid connected electricity in the future, uh, one of the early, um, more obvious benefits is the, the, the um, displacement of expensive diesel generation in remote locations. Uh, it's much easier for a new technology to, co to compete with diesel than it is to compete with um, large scale grid connected electricity at this stage. Um, and a lot of these remote locations happen to be on islands where um, we're you know, surrounded by waves. Um, Wave energy can uh, produce desalinated water as well, also hydrogen and ammonia. But the thing that is unique to, um, well, relatively unique to our technology in that it's not something most um, renewable technologies can do is to double as a breakwater or seawall and therefore um, help against, uh, protect against coastal erosion or to provide um, a breakwater itself as a safe harbour. Uh, in the future, when breakwaters are constructed, generally they're a sunk cost. They cost and they uh, to build and then they cost to maintain. Um, whereas if you're going to build a, um, a breakwater, uh, if you built them out of these units, not necessarily exactly what you see there, but a, a version, and I've, there are some, photo, um, not photographs, but uh, images later on that uh, il illustrate what I mean. Um, you can actually build a breakwater that pays for itself and actually returns a, a recurring revenue. Um, okay, next uh, slide. <clears throat> the environmental benefits. Well, there are there are no moving parts in the water, which I've already mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that means no uh, no harm to marine life, and there are no oils or contaminants used. Uh, remember all the um, all the moving parts of which there really are only, there, there really is only a turbine. There's these simple hinged flaps, uh, passive hinged flaps. But um, other than that, it's just the turbine. Because of the um, unidirectional nature, the, the turbine blades don't need to pitch back and forth, which many previous bi-directional OWCs have had to have. Um, so it's just a, a turbine spinning with fixed blades. So it's just the rotor. Um, they can be manufactured out of basically anything. The, the material that they're manufactured out of is irrelevant. And therefore we're expecting in the future that um, recycled plastics will form um, a key component of the, uh, the construction materials. Uh, they can be refloated and then relocated 
uh, when and where required. In fact, the, the unit that you've seen some photographs of already has already been tested in that regard. We've, we've um, deployed it and then we um, refloated it and then we re redeployed it again just to make sure that was um, doable and it, and it was uh, very much the case. So next, uh, next slide. So moving to the coastal protection in a bit more detail. Um, so I've already mentioned its ability to double as a seawall or it doesn't have to be a, a seawall where the, it's placed side by side. Um, as you can see here in this particular um, uh, illustration, there's units uh, interspersed with uh, normal uh, rubble mound breakwaters. Well, you can put the units completely together and not even and not even re require the rubble mound breakwater. Or uh, if it's not a breakwater that you're desiring, there are many places where you do actually want some wave action on the on the coast, on, on the beach or headlands or whatever. Um, so you can place them uh, at whatever spacing uh, is required to um, reduce the, the amount of energy, so take the sting out of the waves, I guess is a way of describing it, and um, therefore mi uh, reducing the amount of uh, energy that's dissipated on the shoreline. And, and I mean, that that is essentially what causes coastal erosion, the, um, the, the uh, negative effects of um, um, wave energy um, onto the, the coasts themselves. Um, it's a very important application for low-lying island nations. Um, I'll give you an example. The, the Maldives in the um, Indian Ocean, uh, the most, the lowest lying nation on earth um, with a maximum uh, point above sea level of only a few metres. Um, some uh, over a thousand islands of which um, I think somewhere around 150 are inhabited and they acknowledge that they're in, um, you know, real dire straits if um, sea level rise and if and more intense storm events uh, uh, continue. So they have a, a long term view that they're probably eventually all of those inhabitable islands will need to be surrounded by seawalls. And uh, the other thing is they they're almost um, completely dependent on diesel um, for their electricity generation. So it's a, a great combination solution of uh, placing units um, around the islands to actually form the barrier to protect um, to pre protect the island from the, the ocean and at the same time uh, producing cleaner energy and certainly at that scale it would be more uh, far less expensive energy than, than diesel currently is. Um, so therefore it would result in both a cheaper and a cleaner energy source. Um, so uh, you know, it's almost a no-brainer. Um, so it's one of the uh, the only technologies cap capable of being both those things. Uh, next slide, please. The King Island project itself, well, it's located on at Grassy on the southeastern corner of the island. That's where the, the main harbour for King Island is, and it's just uh, located um, uh, 50 metres, I guess, out uh, off the breakwater there. Um, it was deployed on the 10th of January and commenced generating electricity into the Hydro Tasmania grid on the 18th of June, so uh, about six weeks ago, I guess. Um, it's aimed to demonstrate the unique attributes of a unidirectional OWC, um, which we're in the process of doing. Um, just so you're aware, we're, we're gradually um, scaling up its generation. Uh, it, it has a lot, it's a very high tech control system, the electrical control system on the unit, and it's um, uh, it has a whole lot of parameter settings, and uh, we've started out keeping those parameter setting, operational parameter settings quite narrow, uh, the range of them quite narrow, to and testing and gradually widening those um, parameter settings and until it attains uh, full potential. Um, so that shouldn't be too long away. Um, it's quickly developing a global profile. Um, there's a lot of commercial interest being expressed, uh, a lot of media exposure, and, and actually uh, it's opportune, I guess, to mention that uh, next Tuesday, the um, Catalyst program on the ABC will be featuring the technology. So if you're interested, um, have a look next uh, 
next Tuesday at 8.30 on Channel 2. Um, and there's also, we also have a, have a collaboration with the US Department of Energy, um, which I will talk more about in the next slide. I think it's the next slide. Yes. Um, so, yeah, the US Department of Energy uh, um, has requested a collaboration on the King Island project as part of its renewable marine renewable energy program. Um, they've allocated $100,000 of funding to the collaboration itself um, and will have access to all data and results from the project. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the DOE wants to um, analyse the potential of the technology for use in US waters. So uh, um, if everything measures up, um, I, I'm guessing that they will uh, want to um, sort of uh, fund or, or in some way sponsor a, a project in uh, US waters. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, what we're moving to uh, uh, in conjunction with, in parallel with the um, King Island project is what we call Project Blue Fire. Project Blue Fire, the reason it's called Blue Fire is because the Blue Fire is a jellyfish and the most uh, energy efficient um, creature in the ocean. Now, there's a whole list of different things that we're looking at um, developing um, as part of Project Blue Fire. But one of the things will be the um, a, a more sophisticated development of a, um, a way of incorporating these units as part of a breakwater. Now, you can see that example um, in the, the image in the background um, where an entire breakwater is made out of um, uh, units that are then um, combined together, uh, various um, chambers. Um, every one of those circles you see is essentially a um, the inlet for the turbine. And uh, whilst it may not look exactly like this, this is, it's more just as a, um, uh, a something to give you a, a sense of you know what what can be done. So um, that's one of the um, one of the things that will be looked at in terms of um, uh, Project Blue Fire, which is a, a technology enhancement program uh, aimed at uh, you know, ensuring a, a fully commercial product. Um, next, uh, that may be this last slide. Uh, oh no, one, one more, yep. Um, and then we'll be uh, commencing the uh, project pipeline. Um, so there will be follow on projects. We expect um, uh, Alaska is. Um, uh, the uh, authorities in Alaska are expressing a lot of interest, um, particularly off the back of the US DOE's analysis of Alaska's having the greatest uh, potential in the, the US for wave energy. In fact, they've indicated that Alaskan coastlines just through wave energy can power 82 million homes, which is way more than there is in Alaska. But it um, indicates that, uh, you know, there's uh, there could be potentially a lot of surplus energy for production of hydrogen or whatever it might be. Um, and the Maldives is uh, clearly um, of interest, which I've mentioned already. Um, one of the things we understand will have to occur in order to scale up the technology and the deployment of the technology very rapidly is uh, to partner with a major energy or infrastructure company. We're too small a company to be able to um, be building multiple um, projects all over the, the world. So. Uh, there will need to be some sort of partnership, so we're looking at that as well. Um, the scale up uh, is fairly logical. Initially, uh, we're expecting remote locations with high energy costs uh, and, and possibly the, the need for um, breakwaters and seawall projects. Both Alaska and Mal the Maldives have um, fairly serious coastal erosion problems. Um, and then uh, some smaller scale um, potentially supported um, by possibly grants or, or some other funding for um, the, the build up to an array. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, when we achieve full uh, commercial viability, then uh, large scale um, projects um, throughout the world. So uh, that's all there. there is, I think, to the slide, uh, to the presentation. Um, we might just check by moving to the next um, 
slide, which is yeah, just the, the end one. So um, yeah, that that's uh, that's the wave swell technology, and uh, keen to answer any questions. If there is any question, please can you type your question in the uh, chat box, and uh, Tom can answer that and. I see there's um, a hand up. Uh, oh, there's another hand up. Hi, Shab, I, I think the chat function doesn't work. At okay, the moment. so I'll just I'll unmute people and if they can, you can ask your questions. We have, we'll have about five minutes to answer questions before going to the next one. Hello? Anyone? Okay, I'll go to the next. I'll go to the next one. Uh, Ram, if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Shahad. Um, just a, a quick question on, on, on the scale of this. So your your uh, your prototype, like I want to call it, which you currently mm -hmm. deployed in the, in the, in the Bass Strait, can you have an indication of how much energy it actually produces or what, what the ambitions are for that prototype? It's a 200 kilowatt um, unit, but that, that's the peak. And we're not expecting it to average that at all. But um, yeah, 200 kilowatts at, at, on occasions when the waves are big enough. The reason we chose that particular location wasn't because it was the best for wave energy. In fact, it's um, it, it's well below that of the west coast of the of King Island. But what we wanted was a um, a place that regularly ranged between you know quite flat up to decent wave, quite decent size waves without being too big. Um, you know we. I think when you're at the early stage of a technology, you have to ensure accessibility to the unit and you aren't quite sure how everything will go to begin with. And so ensuring that you're able to to um, be on the unit and uh, access it readily is important. If we'd gone to the West Coast, we would have had the ability to produce way more than 200 kilowatts uh, on a regular basis, but we also um, would have potentially struggle to access the unit because often the waves are just big for for weeks at a time so uh, you know it, it was more out of a bit of caution than anything but uh, so the answer is 200 kilowatts maximum but generally you know generally less than that and uh, quite often not much because that's there, there won't be much in the way of waves but we wanted the full range of conditions so that we could verify its performance in that full range rather than just at the top end Okay, thanks. Thanks. Oh, I've got uh, a, a question, Tom, if that's okay. Um, it might follow on a little bit from, from the last one. It was around how have you kind of considered or designed for survivability? Because presumably, so these units are designed to be. I guess maybe during a trial phase, but in the kind of implementation phase in remote locations, like you've mentioned off the coast of Alaska, where I imagine they get some pretty um, sort of hairy wave conditions uh, during their storm season. Um, and unlike, and again, I guess the remote locations mean you can't necessarily retrieve them or do it move them to protect them during yeah. uh, high storms uh, like you would with I guess other marine equipment so how have you yeah how have you designed for them to withstand those storm events well one of the advantages of being in shallow water is the wave heights are depth limited and um, the, the King Island unit for example is in about five meters of water and waves break once their height is about 80 percent of the the um, depth and therefore you know we don't expect to well we won't it's not just expect I mean they physically can't exist above about four meters in that particular depth so we know what the maximum wave is therefore we know the maximum loading on the structure and it's just a simple matter of of um, designing for that rather than in deeper water you have to use a probability based um, you know approach and uh, like one in a hundred year storms you know if you haven't covered that then and one happens then you know you're in trouble but that doesn't happen in shallower water so the way we've we've um, designed to uh, the unit in in this case that particular unit is a concrete gravity structure so it just sits on the seabed under its own weight 
Um, we are definitely looking at moving to other possibilities as well because um, weight means cost, and um, you know we're we're at, um, examining ways of uh, of securing to the seabed um, so that it survives without um, the necessarily going to such uh, um, large weights. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, so we have two, two more minutes, and I think there are a few more questions. Um, sorry, that I'm just going to be se uh, selective. Ben, Ben, you had a question. If you, uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Great talk. Oh, um, I don't know if this is a silly question, but I always, you know, the density of water is a thousand times that of air. Would you not get more energy from having the impeller in the water rather than in the air? Um, you, you're right. It's, it's it's well, it's 860 something times, but a thousand's close enough. Um, but uh, you, what happens is when you when the wave rises, that all the energy it doesn't um, it still gets imparted, or, or a great percentage of it at least still gets imparted into the airflow. Now, what that means is the airflow is much quicker. So it's really you look at um, I forget the exact f formula or equation for the amount of energy in a fluid flowing. I think it's half rho v squared, and the rho becomes much heavier for water, of course, but the the v becomes much smaller, much lower. So the the net result is you you still end up with most of the energy in the airflow because the airflow is going so much quicker. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if, if it's okay, th thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. Great presentation. Um, not sure how much you can hang around. I know that you have some business to attend. Uh, uh, next is Francois. Okay. Thank, thanks for uh, listening, and uh, I will hang around for a, at least a little bit. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Francois Flocar, and uh, I'm principal engineer at the Water Research Lab from UNSW Sydney. And now I will attempt to share my screen. So let's see how we go with that. And, and here we go. Uh, can I get the confirmation that everyone is seeing the first slide? Yep. Well, good. So I guess my my talk will be a bit more general and didactic and uh, maybe used as, a, as an introduction to what we commonly refer as marine renewable energies. So in terms of the outline of the talk, I'll talk about marine renewables, I guess then delve a bit more into the one that are the most relevant to, to Australia at this stage, that is tidal and ocean waves. And then we'll I guess give a, a bigger introduction on the on, on wave energy conversion and the, the type of converters and the, and some principle of energy conversion. So when we talk about marine renewable energy, uh, I guess if we start from the left, uh, it, people sometimes think about marine renewable as offshore renewable, and it's a bit different because I guess uh, we could think about uh, floating photovoltaic or offshore wind, which are a bit of uh, you know, necessarily just more using solar or, or wind. Marine renewable, and in this case, Tom, the little image called ocean energy, is mainly made out of four different type of, of energy conversions or also uh, resource. And uh, the one in Australia, as I said, that are really commonly active uh, and in development is tidal energy and wave energy. But there are also two other main sources of, of marine renewable, and it's that is the ocean thermal energy conversion, also known as OTEC, and salinity gradient. And uh, while these ones are maybe not actively uh, pursued in Australia, they, they are uh, in other areas around the world. So salinity gradient uh, is effectively, the salinity gradient power is the energy created from the difference in salt concentration between two fluids, commonly uh, fresh water and salt water, so that's where in, uh, where a river flows into the sea. And uh, there are different uh, ways of converting this, this, this uh, salinity gradient power. Uh, the most common is called uh, pressure retarded osmosis, or PRO. And 
as the uh, image on the left show, it's effectively, it used a, a semi-permeable membrane to separate uh, concentrated salt water, seawater, let's say, uh, from fresh water. In this membrane, semi-permeable, basically use one of the property of, of fresh water and salt water is that fresh water wants to flow towards salt water. And the, the membrane is basically unidirectional. So it only allows fresh water to enter the salt water pressure chamber, create a, a pressure buildup, that can drive then a turbine and generate electricity. So it's pretty much still in, in, in early uh, R&D stages. And uh, the photo on the right shows the, a plant in Norway that operated for nearly a decade in uh, the 2000-2010 um, uh, with a rated capacity of 10 kilowatts, so pretty small. And uh, one of the big hurdles still right now is the membrane technology and, uh, and is currently an active field of research. But an interesting aspect of this, uh, of this marine renewable source is that research has proven that uh, the efficiency uh, is greatly increased when the concentration of salt in the salt fluid is, is, uh, is uh, increased. So you can think about this technology that, that could work uh, in almost synergy with desalination, where you could potentially try to reuse the brine uh, to to basically create power and uh, and therefore reduce the the power load of of desalination. The next uh, marine renewable source is, as I said, is called OTEC. It, it is actually pretty old. Uh, the first uh, OTEC plant was uh, deployed uh, for uh, I think uh, a few years. I mean records are are not uh, maybe as extensive because. Uh, uh, it was deployed in the Caribbean uh, at the turn of the uh, of the 1900s. And how does OTEC work? Effectively, it's uh, it's a process that produce energy by harnessing the temperature differences or thermal gradients between the ocean surface water and the deep water. Uh, as a schematic sort of show, uh, you basically have constant all year long uh, four degrees water when you go deeper than 1,000 meter. And as the little map shows also, if you're located near the equator, you also have pretty constant temperature in the surface water, let's say uh, uh, 20, 20 degrees or, or 30 degrees plus. So you then basically pump both of these water and, uh, and basically use them to drive a heat engine uh, in a closed circle, for example, with a ranking cycle and, and using a, a low pressure point fluid such as ammonia which then get vaporized when it gets uh, warmed by the, the, the warm water through a heat exchanger, vaporized, drive the turbine, and that gets cooled by the, uh, the, the cool water that has been pumped from the depths. Uh, so effectively, it's uh, an advantage of this technology is that it can produce a base load. It is, uh, you know, it is non-effectively non non-fluctuating. Non uh, these are two uh, recent, uh, basically, uh, plants of uh, uh, OTEC. The first one that can clearly be associated with the, uh, the diagram that I showed before is located in Hawaii with a rated capacity of 105 uh, uh, kilowatts. Uh, and I guess an advantage for OTEC is, uh, or first a requirement is to be located close to the equator, typically, because that's where the resource is with the warm water, but it is also, uh, basically perfect for, uh, let's, let's call it, uh, sorry, basically Pacific Island nations where uh, due to the nearshore bathymetry being very, very steep, you don't have to basically uh, pipe for very long distance to reach this, this 1,000 uh, meter depth. Uh, the other image is from uh, effectively a no take barge because that is what uh, right now a lot of projects are looking at. So basically bring the plant offshore or and, uh, and also have the possibility to, to move it um, and was developed by the uh, effectively the, the Korean CSIRO uh, um, uh, with a rated power of one megawatt and uh, is planned to be deployed in the coming months. Uh, and sadly, the project was a bit delayed uh, due to COVID, but near uh, the island of Kiribati. Another advantage, I guess, in sort of an additional advantage of FOTEC is uh, there's been a plant similar to the, the one in Hawaii in terms of freighted capacity that was actually using the deep water 
that had been pumped to uh, to the shore uh, and which is very nutrient rich to uh, actually uh, go through a nearby um, uh, aquaculture farm. So then the next uh, marine renewable source it's tidal. So uh, one of the main advantage of tidal energy is as we all know as being a, a marine or coastal engineer is the complete predictability. It is, you know, to a certain, rank, uh, certain, certain sense, it, it is fully predictable. But when you talk about tidal, you basically need to separate two different kinds of, of, of tidal power. The first one is tidal range. And uh, it's effectively, as the diagram shows on the, on the bottom, it's effectively using trying to harness the power in the, the head difference between uh, low tide and high tide. And the way it's done is uh, through the use of what is usually referred to tidal barrage or barrages, sorry. Uh, uh, and the uh, first one was uh, installed in France, uh, Florence, with a rated capacity of 250 megawatts. So there, these barrages are loca located typically at the uh, estuary of a river and through the use of sluice gates, basically isolates uh, one side of the of the basin that is created to basically release the water when uh, the height difference is at the maximum. Uh, one more recent uh, big project that has been put in, uh, in, uh, in use was in Korea, where they have a very uh, large uh, tidal range there and uh, rated around also 250 megawatts. One disadvantage of tidal barrage is obviously it's a barrier in, inside a, or really across an estuary. So it's typically associated with saltation problems, uh, as well as being a, a barrier to uh, fauna migration. So the other tidal source is tidal currents. And I'm really happy that uh, Ben and Tom have been talking about uh, the difference of density between water and air, because that's what I wanted to talk about. And if you look at the diagram at the top, which show an offshore wind turbine, and if you're able to see uh, at the bottom, the small turbine here, that's a tidal turbine. And tidal turbine is exactly that. It's, uh, it's, it's the same as a wind turbine, except it's located underwater and harness the, uh, the tidal currents, the, the flow of water passing it. And as we've said, the uh, 800, uh, 800 more dense fluid mean that to basically, for the same power rating of two megawatts, a tidal turbine can be around 20 meter in diameter as opposed to uh, nearly 90 meter or 100 meter for, for a wind turbine. Uh, and that's one of the most recent tidal turbines that have been uh, uh, deployed in uh, near Scotland. The typical tidal uh, velocity uh, uh, required for a tidal stream project are above, above two meter per second, ideally four meter per second during peak tides. So now in terms of the resource in Australia, uh, recently the Austin project, uh, which was led by AMC and CSIRO, uh, basically uh, was, the objective was to, uh, to improve our understanding of, uh, of tidal uh, resource, tidal characteristic around Australia, and uh, consisted in developing a nationwide, unstructured, high resolution, hydrodynamic tidal model to, um, to investigate this and, and better characterize it. Uh, in terms of tidal range, as, uh, as we all know, most or as we may, you may know, uh, the highest uh, tidal range is located on the, in the northwest of, of Western Australia, uh, with a maximum uh, tidal range of, of uh, over 11 meter near Derby, which in terms of, oh, this is really extreme, uh, but it, it ranks, I think, in, in the top 10 of, of tidal range location around the world with the highest uh, tidal range being in Canada uh, with 16 meter. Uh, on the other end, we can see that from tidal range, as uh, uh, people in, in Victoria and New South Wales know, it's it's it's, it's pretty minor uh, compared to uh, a lot of other places in the world, such as uh, Northern Europe or, or even the US. In terms of tidal currents, uh, not surprisingly, they're they're also uh, the highest, the most powerful location is also close to the highest tidal range. Uh, and we're dealing with the maximum uh, spring tide velocity of, of uh, over 3.5 meter per second uh, near, uh, near the King Sound, 
but also, as as you may see around there, uh, on the northern shore, uh, northern sorry, uh, coast of, of Tasmania, because tidal currents don't necessarily need big tidal range to exist uh, if you have uh, very specific uh, bathymetric features, uh, such as you know, channels or, or steep, uh, steep changes, as well as constriction due to uh, location of island, uh, you can then basically achieve big velocity due to the difference in phases, of, phases in the tides. Uh, and that's an example of, uh, of basically the, zoom, uh, the zoomed in model for uh, Beagle Gulf, uh, where the highest velocity has been uh, basically assessed. The result of the uh, OSTEN uh, project is uh, available uh, online on the national map portal. Uh, so that's basically uh, any, uh, any, any individual or company interested in, uh, in tidal, uh, harnessing tidal energy in, in Australia can, can basically uh, work with this existing work. Now, uh, ocean waves. And uh, I give part of this presentation to a uh, first year student at university and has to go, I have to go through the, basically, uh, the nature of ocean wave, the formation of ocean wave, but I know here most of the people will be very well versed. But I think it's still important to, to remember when we're talking about ocean wave, that, that the creation of waves, the wind blowing and, and creating developed seas and then swell is that, uh, on this diagram, you would basically have waves of very different height, but mainly of different periods, like ranging from four seconds up to uh, you know 15 seconds and plus. Likewise, if we look through the, the water column, uh, wa waves are effectively just uh, basically uh, a manifestation of a transport of energy, uh, of the wind energy that has been basically uh, transformed to the, transferred to the water surface, is that the, the manifestation of this energy transfer through the water column is also very different if you are in deep water or in shallow water, uh, and depending where you are in the water column. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, in deeper water, uh, waves are you know, linear. There's, there's as much basically uh, vertical velocity as horizontal velocity under the wave, whereas if we go uh, in the near shore, we basically have a very surge dominating uh, velocity um, field in the water column. And I'll get back to this when we're talking about technology. So now the wave power resource, uh, this is a, an annual uh, a map, a global map of annual mean wave power. Uh, the annual mean wave power is greatest in the, uh, the higher latitude of the southern hemisphere, uh, between 40 degrees south and 60 degrees south. And due to the dominant uh, trade winds, uh, especially on the on the western coasts of uh, the, the different continents. So Chile, South Africa and, and Australia uh, basically receive uh, very high power levels uh, on average through the year. In the North Atlantic, because of the of the of the land mass interrupting the, the train winds, it's on the western coast of the US and, and northern Europe, south of, of Greenland. Uh, uh, until recently, I guess when we were talking about good wave resource, the, the number that was thrown around was uh, anything above uh, 30 kilowatt per meter. And just maybe to clarify, when we're talking about kilowatt per meter, we're talking per meter of width of crest of wave coming through. So uh, the, the very high number, if we think about just a one meter uh, uh, wide wave. Uh, now, CSIRO in 2016, uh, did a big uh, nationwide uh, atlas about uh, the wave power resource and, and wave characteristic around Australia. And uh, one interesting number is that uh, if you take the, uh, the annual power uh, at the 200 meter deep isobath and integrate that from, let's say, Perth to Hobart, you, you get over, uh, you get nearly 3,000 terawatt hour per year nationally, which is one order of magnitude higher than the Australian uh, nationwide uh, energy consumption. So yes, that's at 200 meter. That's very uh, irrealistic to think that we can harness all of this power. But something that is really quite unique compared to other locations in the world is that because of the nature of the southern shelf, uh, when you think, oh, we're not going to put devices in 200 meter water depths, 
uh, let, let's put them closer to shore in, in shallower water, is that the, the, uh, the energy lost due to friction and wave propagating near shore is quite, uh, quite minimal compared to other sites in the world. At, uh, at around uh, 50 meter depths, we still have 90% of, uh, of the power. And when we go down to uh, 20 meter, we still got 60% uh, 60 of this power. And most of the power uh, for, for wave power is, is located, yes, as I said, from basically Perth to, to Tasmania. It's uh, due to the sheltering uh, effect, it's, it's lesser in the, on the uh, east coast. But one advantage, I guess, or, or one specificity of the ocean climate is the uh, it's relatively low variability. Th this map shows the ratio of monthly variability to, to the mean power. And uh, while well, there's some variability uh, in, uh, between Perth and, and Adelaide and, and Melbourne, let's say, it's, it's very much less uh, than uh, in, for example, places like the, uh, the North Sea in, in Europe, where between summer and winter months, you can really have a huge differential. But what's interesting for the Eastern Seaboard, let's say from New South Wales and, and South Queensland, is that on the other end, if the power levels are lower, they're more in the in the, in 10, 15 kilowatt per meter, they're quite consistent all year long, which is a, a nice feature for a renewable energy source. Again, uh, all of this information and these maps at uh, quite a high resolution are available on the national map uh, portal. So now the technology. Uh, if you think about wind power technology to the offshore wind turbine from the three main suppliers, I'm pretty sure I could have changed the name of the manufacturer, sorry, uh, under each of this photo, and not many people in the room would have been able to say, no, that's not a, a Vesta statistic in Scamessa. It's, it's a very mature technology, as we know. Uh, the design has converged to three blades on a pile. Tidal energy, uh, even if there's still different designs, as uh, maybe Christophe will be talking about uh, in the next talk, it's the, we're coming near uh, convergence. It's uh, you know horizontal turbine with uh, you know, a multiple blade, but uh, uh, this is starting, starting to be the consensus in the in the industry of uh, what uh, what tidal turbines look at. Their uh, maximum rated currently at two megawatt per meter, and typically sit in about uh, due to their diameter, uh, thirty meter uh, of of water. Another feature due to the density of the fluid and the, the nature of the currents is uh, they basically they're, they're quite slow in their rotation. We're, we're talking about maybe five RPM, so uh, quite slow moving uh, devices. So now ocean wave, uh, that's a bit different. That's a slide that I made for presentation 2016, showing the, the devices that were uh, under uh, development, but also deployed. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's hard to find some, some clear similarities. Well, five years later, we're, we're still there. It's, it's still, I mean, it, they all look very different. And you could argue that, yes, well, that shows that uh, we're still far from maturity uh, in terms of technology. But I think now there's another consensus is that uh, there may never be uh, uh, one technology uh, better than the other, or, or there will always be a variability. And that is because, as I discussed before, it's, uh, it, it is also associated with the nature of, uh, of the wave power that you're trying to convert, like where you located, the nature of your resource, and uh, where do you want to be in the water column. So how do we make sense of all of this, I guess? Uh, maybe first we'll we think about we, we try to understand okay wh where does wave power uh, conversion come well, when does it start and uh, i'm sure it started before 1799 in france uh, but the first patent that was ever uh, found uh, was on, on wave energy conversion was by this uh, uh, girard father and son which uh, the records say that they were uh, uh, sea merchants and uh, did a patent, never uh, was clear if they ever, ever did anything, like what happened a lot of time was patent, but they were a thing of uh, let's harness wave energy in the, in the port to uh, load cargo in, in their ship. The first patented uh, 
wave energy in a way device that uh, resulted in, in a clear real world application and, and I guess commercial uh, aspect is referred to as the Courtney whistling whistling boy. So Gian Courtney of New York patented this uh, whistling boy, which as I will talk is, is not that different in a way from an oscillating water column. There's an open tube uh, below the, the floating body of the boy. So you've got a water, uh, uh, basically a piston moving up and down uh, within this tube, which would uh, activate a whistle. And uh, he sold these boys for uh, the northeast coast of, of the US, Nantucket, for example, where I guess uh, people were quite happy to have a, a navigation aid, aid even during a night or, or fog. Uh, then uh, other historical records show, again in France in uh, 1912, this uh, uh, person called uh, Monsieur Bouchot Prastique, which uh, effectively was uh, at a house near a cliff and uh, it's not clear if there was a natural blowhole or did he drill this himself uh, but uh, effectively created a, a basically the, that's the first record of a no oscillating water column system where the water would basically activate here uh, you know moving up and down water level and uh, he uh, there uh, connected this to a shaft and uh, put a uh, a turbine and generated electricity and uh, the rated capacity was uh, only one kilowatt uh, but yeah that's the first ever record of uh, electricity produced i guess by uh, wave energy but modern wave energy really started in, in 1964 uh, when uh, or i mean in the 1950s the patent is 1964 but in japan from uh, uh, mr masuda who uh, you could say mixed uh, the Courtney Whistling Boy was the classic uh, elect small electrical turbine and uh, basically created this uh, navigation buoys that were deployed uh, in, uh, in the numbers of places around, around Japan with you know, very small uh, power capacity, uh, a few kilowatts, uh, but was basically powering uh, the, the, the lights and, the, and, the, and the, the sirens. So making sense of nowadays of, of the different wave uh, energy uh, technology. So the first one, which is the one that Tom uh, uh, talked about and is being used in, uh, in the wave swell device in King Island is called the oscillating water column. And as the video will show, you basically have an horizontal opening in, a, in, basically in, a, in the chamber that then allow the water to move up and down, creating an airflow and uh, basically powering a turbine. And, uh, as Tom explained, they can be fixed or floating. The names in bold are location where such devices have been installed and, and run. Uh, and so the, the uh, project of Mutriku in the Basque country in Spain uh, is, is very similar to what Tom was, was talking. They, they had a breakwater, they wanted to upgrade uh, it for uh, basically providing better, uh, better port accessibility, as you can see in the background, and uh, went, well, okay, uh, let's Let's try to uh, integrate into our breakwater uh, an energy source and oscillating water column. So, due to cost, uh, the final design uh, basically showed that they, they, they had enough fun just to uh, put this oscillating water column and, and big concrete structure just along a certain length of the breakwater. But uh, each of these cases, there's 16 of them, uh, have individual op opening, and uh, you can see on the right uh, the individual turbines. This, uh, the site of Mutriku has uh, basically reached a milestone in 2020 by uh, producing more than two, two gigawatt hour. So they're still small numbers compared to, to big mature uh, uh, renewable technology. But uh, the interesting part for Mutriku is that it's, uh, it's now being basically used as an open uh, R&D uh, facility where developers of turbine or control technology or different kind of equipment for uh, Marine Renewable can come and basically uh, book and I guess uh, test in one of the 16 uh, birth or texting, testing day. Another way for selling water column, uh, I'll not I'll move quickly on this one, but yeah, it can be a floating structure or a structure that can be floated and then and then moored, such as what Tom presented in the way as well. Mm. Oh, sorry. Uh, so now, 
Okay. The the other one, and I guess that's that's really the slide that uh, because if you see all the different little bodies moving in different ways, that explains uh, a lot of the variety in the photos that I showed before. And I guess these wave energy converters are referred to as oscillating body or sometimes point absorber or surge converter. And effectively, you've got a floating structure uh, which absorbs energy from all directions or one direction and convert this motion uh, of this buoy on top relative to a base or a fixed point of reference and, uh, and basically transform this, this motion uh, in terms of uh, basically in a, into a torque and, uh, and can create electrical uh, power or hydraulic power that then get converted into electricity. Uh, they can be floating, they can be submerged, they can use uh, heaving or they can use swaying or, or, or surging. And, and that's why all these devices uh, look very different. Uh, some of you will recognize uh, the Carnegie uh, CETO device, which is a uh, submerged heaving device. This is located uh, at the surface or, or under the surface and moves up and down and basically uh, pull on a tether that, uh, that basically pressurizes fluid. Here again would be uh, the OPT, one of the OPT uh, offshore buoys. So this one would be located in really deep water. Uh, but they can also be uh, you know, uh, fixed to, uh, to port infrastructure. And in this case, these floats would be you know, moved up and down. I think it's in Gibraltar and, uh, and uh, basically uh, pressurize the hydraulic fluid and create electricity. The last type of device is uh, it's called a runoff device or overtopping device. And uh, like the video will show effectively using the, the runoff of the wave uh, being harnessed into uh, uh, separate reservoir uh, and creating basically a head uh, that then drives a low head turbine. So they have been uh, basically uh, tested as a BTS prototype as floating structure. The wave dragon in, in Denmark has been, uh, uh, been tested for, for many years. But more recently, uh, uh, one of these devices has been integrated into a breakwater in Italy where effectively the run-up of the wave would basically get into the, uh, the uh, left, let's say, chamber, run through a turbine, and, uh, and, uh, and be released through the, uh, the, the lower one. Uh, conclusion, I guess, in terms of wave energy, those photos are all uh, devices that have been uh, deployed in the last 18 months or in operation. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a very dynamic sector. It's very dynamic in Australia, as uh, Christoph will be uh, will be uh, talking about in his next talk. And uh, yeah, thank you. So if you want to uh, learn more or, or or join this active community of uh, research and uh, industry in Australia, there's there's two ways. There's a there's a group on LinkedIn called Marine Renewable Australia, and there's uh, a cluster, uh, an industry-led cluster called AOEG. Uh, which is led by Stephanie Thornton and uh, given the website where both uh, research actors and industries are effectively trying to promote and, and work together to uh, increase visibility and success of uh, ocean energy in Australia. And that'll be the end of my talk. And because everyone's silent, I'm really hoping that uh, I was not speaking <laughs> in the void. Thanks, Francois. Uh, Francois. Uh, uh, we're just uh, going directly to Christoph. I don't think we have time for uh, questions now. If, yeah. uh, let's see, here we go. Good luck, Christoph. Thanks, Francois. Um, thanks a lot, Chab. So I hope you all hear me. I'm going to share my screen as well. And uh, um, that's it. So um, I hope you can all see it now. Yes, we can. OK, thanks a lot. All right, so um, my name is Christophe Godin. I'm the head of the Ocean Energy, uh, Ocean Engineering Group, sorry, at the University of Western Australia and the director of the Wave Energy Research Center, which was created in, in 2017. Um, so Francois gave a very excellent overview of all the different marine renewable energy technology, and I thought that uh, I would I would approach that with a slightly different angle and try to make a parallel between 
the state of the affair in the offshore wind energy space and, and, and make the case for the wave energy. Uh, so I start by talking about slightly, you know, shortly about the need for decarbonization, uh, uh, provide a very short summary about the role of offshore renewable energy, and then look your view of the landscape worldwide and in Australia of the offshore wind energy. And again, uh, make the case for wave energy and, and trying to look at what are the perceived challenges when it comes to the commercial deployment of wave energy and, and how we can either debug some of these challenges or actually uh, uh, maybe also uh, address them through specific activities. And that's going to lead me to the supporting initiatives that I think are going to be extremely uh, helpful uh, uh, to move forward commercialization of wave energy. So the need for decarbonization. So this is some data, you know, that have been uh, um, uh, assembled by the IPPC, and I don't think I need to go. Uh, I, I don't think I need to dwell on that very much. You know, I'm sure that I preach a, a converted audience. You know, about the need for decarbonization. Uh, the current policies, you know, are putting us on the on the trend for a temperature increase by uh, the end of the century around 2.8 and 3.2 degrees. You know, which is uh, quite significant. Uh, uh, because there is basically an understanding that uh, if we go over 1.5, the effects on, on, on many different aspects of our life is going to be uh, quite significant, you know. So I think we all know that, we're all aware of that. What I'm not sure, you know, I think it's still necessary to reinforce that message because as we talk, you know, to a broad range of stakeholders, it doesn't necessarily sink uh, completely. And I'm not sure yet that uh, uh, even if there is no uh, fairly good and broad consensus about the need for decarbonization, but we actually fully understand the urgency of it. Uh, the sixth assessment of uh, the IPPC will come by the end of the year, and some uh, of the uh, uh, conclusions are starting to leak, you know, uh, within the different uh, uh, medias. And so uh, on the 17 metrics or indicators that are used, you know, to uh, test the health of the planet, uh, 11 basically are reaching a tipping point, uh, uh, an irreversible tipping point where not only basically uh, this will have significant consequences on our life, but also, you know, potential cascading effect that are going to uh, uh, accelerate and, and worsen the, the, the prospect. So, so I think this sense of urgency is important. I wish that it would shape, you know, the energy policies uh, in, in most of our countries. I'm not sure this is the case uh, yet. Uh, but uh, I still have quite a lot of hope, you know, because when COVID came and that was completely unexpected, you know, there was mobilization across uh, all the planets uh, to put in place, you know, uh, emergency measures. And the motto was, you know, whatever it costs. And I think eventually we'll come to that point when it comes to energy policy. And so we'll accelerate things quite significantly, whatever it costs. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because, in my opinion, you know, that puts things in, in different perspective when we're going to uh, address some of these perceived challenges that we are facing with the development of wave energy. So very briefly here, because again, Francois has, has, has addressed that uh, extremely well. So when we talk about uh, renewable and offshore renewable energy, we talk about wave, wave and tidal. Uh, as I will be uh, developing, you know, uh, wind is now very well established, you know, and so and we've got numerous commercial projects all across the world. Uh, tidal and wave are still basically in some development phase, uh, phase not exactly at the same uh, level, uh, but we are yet to see large scale commercial development that is going to uh, uh, um, unleash the potential on these two technologies. And we'll try to develop that in a bit more detail. A number here, which I think is important to, uh, um, remi to, to uh, remember, and so I'll come back to that later, is that as the world electricity consumption at the moment is about, about 25,000 terawatt hour per year. And so um, um, we'll keep in this number in mind, you know, when we'll talk briefly about resources later. So what is the state of uh, offshore wind? So as I mentioned, you know, it's a very well established uh, technology. Uh, some mapping we are done and we can see that we have significant resources in many different locations in the world. And uh, if you can see my cursor, you know, there is indeed a lot uh, in the northern of Europe. And which is the reason why I suspect, you know, we've got significant offshore wind development in the UK, in Denmark, in Norway and in the North Sea in general. But we actually do have some significant resources as well in Australia, which are uh, remaining untapped, but uh, which are offering a significant uh, uh, potential. Uh, so the 
wind technology has been going through some development, you know, over the last 50 years, you know, and I've got this just here a snapshot of the last uh, 30 years. As Francois mentioned, the technology has made to a single free blade technology after significant research and development. And over the last 30 years, we can see that we've been going through a single wind turbine with a 0.4 megawatt capacity to now turbines that are at a much higher significant scale, you know, at the 12 megawatt capacity. And I think there is even projects for 14 or, or 16 megawatt, you know, and are no longer single turbine, but now assembled in farm and so providing capacity in the order of gigawatts. You've got here some numbers about the potential, the capacity instead, you know, uh, in the world. Europe is definitely uh, leading the way, you know, with a significant capacity instead and some projects coming up uh, in the coming years. North America uh, is starting uh, to increase their, uh, their capacity quite significantly. And so Australia is still leading, uh, lagging behind when it comes to uh, offshore wind. Uh, um, and I think this is something that needs to be addressed. And that has been basically addressed actually by a recent report from the Blue Economy CRC that explained basically the potential that offshore wind could offer to Australia and calling for a renewed consideration of the substantial contribution offshore wind can make to the Australian future clean energy mix. And so, but also, you know, to the Australian economy in terms of job creation and so on, which is also, which is always a very important uh, consideration uh, uh, for uh, governments. So if we look at what's going to happen in Australia, things are actually progressing and there is obviously uh, a, a significant project uh, uh, happening. And so I'm sure you're all aware of it. This is uh, um, a Star of the South development uh, located in Victoria offshore, offshore uh, Gippsland. Um, it's an $8 billion project for two uh, gigawatt uh, capacity. And I think uh, it's quite uh, uh, interesting to uh, consider this number for a couple of seconds. You know, this is, uh, as far as I know, this is going to be the largest uh, uh, offshore wind uh, farm, uh, wind farm in the world, you know. Um, and, and to put things in perspective, uh, you may know that France at the moment is developing its third generation uh, nuclear reactor. Uh, the water pressure uh, reactor. Uh, it has started 12 years ago, and uh, the cost for the project at the moment is estimated at uh, 23 billion euros for a capacity of 2.2 gigawatts. So I think it's interesting to see that actually wind offers, you know, a very uh, uh, appealing perspective uh, uh, when it comes to large scale uh, energy production. So specifically for that development, uh, uh, it's meant to basically supply up to 20% of the Victoria electricity needs. It's going to be connected to the grid, you know, for transmission cable through the Latrop Valley. And at the moment, a lot of activities is, is taking place. And so there is many actually uh, webinars organized by the different stakeholders, you know, uh, 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 for the project uh, uh, to start as, as rapidly as possible. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, there's a lot of work done in the background in terms of licensing and permitting and putting in place you know, the regulation framework, which is going to be uh, able to, to enable uh, this project in, in the future. Uh, when we look at Australia uh, at, a, at a greater scale, you know, there is up to actually 12 current proposals, you know, totaling more than 25 gigawatts uh, all across Australia, both on, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. So I think there is definitely some traction in that space and hopefully Australia uh, uh, will soon basically join the, the leading group uh, with Europe and North America when it comes to offshore wind. The next frontier when it comes to offshore wind is to go from fixed uh, to floating, you know, uh, that has different uh, advantages. I mean, first, it expands the number and size of potential areas you can uh, install your developments, and that may be a cons uh, uh, actually an advantage in, in some community, you know, uh, uh, where there is actually some resistance uh, uh, for uh, uh, floating, uh, for fixed offshore wind uh, um, near the coast. Uh, it's more efficient installation and maintenance. It has less environmental impact because obviously you are further down the coast and better resources and increased capacity. Uh, it's still in development. There is a, a few projects in place uh, as demonstrator, including the one I've showed here, which is uh, Tetraspar uh, in the North Sea, um, uh, and which is actually a project that uh, we are involved here, uh, um, uh, monitoring the data and analyzing and modeling the data of the floating substation but uh, on which the wind turbine uh, is attached. 
So when it comes to wave energy, uh, and again, Francois has explained that uh, extremely well, you know, there is at the moment uh, very different uh, technologies. I've just given a snapshot here of some of the uh, uh, technologies uh, in uh, progress, you know, uh, Tom has explained uh, wave swell. Uh, we've got Carnegie Wave Energy, Core Power, it's another uh, um, point absorber, and Bombora Wave Power, a company initially uh, born and, and installed in, in um, Australia in Perth and now located in Wales and, and uh, putting development in the UK and in uh, Spain. So when we look at, so why wave is interesting? So uh, we look at the resources, you know, and so it's it's just, it's roughly the same uh, uh, slide that uh, Francois has, uh, has provided, you know, but the resources are simply uh, um, uh, huge. And so, and if you look at the potential worldwide, and so we've got 17.5 terawatts hour per year and if you remember the first slides i've presented you know the total energy consumption is about the 25 uh, terawatts so so there is the, the point of that slide is just to demonstrate the huge potential and obviously not this not all this energy can be captured you know but there is definitely a potential to make some significant contribution to the uh, energy consumption and so then that brings us to the perceived challenge and why, you know, with such potential, wave energy is not in a more mature stage of development and, and has rich commercial, you know, uh, proposal. And so there is different challenges. And the first one may be, you know, what is the localized cost of the energy? And the fact that there is this perception that uh, the cost of energy produced by wave is far higher than any other alternatives, including in the renewable space, like offshore wind and onshore wind, and therefore it's not a competitive technology. And I think it's missing a bit, you know, uh, some perspective. Uh, uh, first, uh, we are comparing, you know, technology which is not fully mature yet with technology that have under, uh, undergone, you know, significant development and, and investment and so on. And so it's also forgetting about the economy of scale that's going to be generated through the installation of large farm like it's happening, you know, uh, uh, for wind. And so this is in some extent, you know, uh, uh, developed in, in that in that um, uh, plots, you know, that shows that as you actually create economy of scale, you go down the um, cost curve quite significantly. So wave or tidal is actually not indicated in that slide simply because we don't have full commercial project generating electricity on which we can make, you know, uh, a very accurate uh, uh, estimation of the localized cost of energy. And so when I talked about economy of scale, I think we also need to talk about specific, you know, uh, development of the technology. And I think there is no reason why uh, uh, the cost curve that wave energy uh, can experience wouldn't be any different to the cost curve that has experienced wind uh, uh, energy over the last, uh, you know, 50 years. And we can see that through technological development and through economy of scale, as we were increasing the capacity of the turbine and assembling them into farm, the cost was reduced by almost a factor of 10, you know, over 40 to 50 years. And I don't see why uh, it should be any different for, for wave energy if the effort uh, 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 to develop it would be any different. A second, I think, misconception with this uh, issue of localized cost of energy is uh, uh, the match between the technology in the market. And I think, as, as Francois again alluded, you know, wave energy is unlikely to merge uh, towards a single technology. It's most likely to remain as a broad range of different technology, and this is actually a strength. This is not a weakness. This is a strength because that allows the technology, you know, to assess a wide variety of markets. Markets where we need uh, low value and high demand, so we need to generate, you know, a very high uh, capacity and at very cheap price. So this is in the gigawatt capacity. But at the other extreme, there are markets of ultra high value and low demand, where the cost of energy can be significantly higher because it fulfills a different purpose. And so keeping that in mind, I think we can align that very well with the different technology. Uh, um, which are uh, uh, still in progress, you know, from the, micro, the kilowatt up to the megawatt and fulfill different purposes in different uh, markets. And I think this is actually something to consider when we think about localized cost of energy and the potential development of wave energy technology. 
The second uh, uh, perceived challenge is, is about survivability. And the thing that, you know, when you go into the ocean and so you try to capture wave uh, energy, you are in an extremely harsh environment. And obviously you want to locate your devices when you've got the highest energy, which means that this is where the highest, the harshest environment is, you know. And working through the survivability issue uh, is, is quite an important uh, uh, aspect. And here I'm just going to basically mention a bit, you know, some of the research that we are doing in our group, you know, and so you can see here the testing of a, a Carnegie uh, a device uh, a wave energy converter uh, in uh, Plymouth, you know, undertaken by our team here, where we exposed uh, uh, the, the device through a different uh, uh, energy uh, uh, wave spectrum. And so with the idea basically to come up with a methodology to fast track the identification of the extreme conditions, you know, to be able to better model these conditions and to better uh, design the device against these extreme conditions. Another aspect of the survivability is, uh, is what we call, you know, the uh, wave by wave prediction where we deploy uh, spotters or boys in front of the device and by uh, measuring the waves a few hundred meters before they arrive on the device and running a prediction tool exercise, we can actually tune the PTO here either to maximize the energy output or actually to put the uh, device into a surviving mode, for example, to avoid the most extreme waves uh, um, and, and make sure that the device is going to survive uh, uh, the, the most extreme wave. And you can see here an example of the performance of the wave predictor against an experimental record. You know, which is, and these data actually are, are coming from uh, uh, our measurements of the waves uh, in Albany. So the third perceived challenge, you know, and so and, and maybe the lack of experience and lesson learned, and the fact that uh, if I compare, you know, the wave energy landscape to other uh, um, landscape, and notably the wind energy, there is a lack of national overarching supporting program, for instance, with a very strong incentive, you know, at the uh, federal government level, you know, to uh, uh, promote this technology, uh, both by supporting the uh, developers, but also the researchers. Uh, the investors, the private investors, having the relevant regulation framework associated with that and so on. And I think we're still missing, you know, that large scale support at the highest level to uh, fully enable the potential of the technology. The technology is also uh, uh, characterized by uh, several SMEs working, you know, uh, in, in silos in some extent, you know, and, and, and with some challenges to share the learnings, the success and the failure, you know, and to socialize basically all these learnings to make sure that we get the most benefit of it. And I think also a perception that there is probably too much focus on this overlaced cost of energy and a misunderstanding about what the energy market is and how wave energy technology can actually uh, uh, fulfill these markets. And probably a too narrow focus as well on the uh, TRL, the technology readiness level, you know, and with some kind of, um, um, understanding more recently that going through the uh, technology performance curve, as we call it, is probably a more efficient way to reach basically my full maturity of the technology and therefore reducing the cost up front of the development of this technology. And there is a quite a few uh, literature on the uh, TRL, TPL, TPL um, uh, comparison uh, emerging at the moment. And maybe uh, one of the last uh, uh, Challenge is, you know, it's the lack of end user engagement and our ability to convince the end users of the potential you know, of wave energy and having them fully engaged in supporting uh, uh, our SMEs, you know, our research program and, and the development of this technology. But the good thing is that I think there is light at the end of the tunnel because there is some extremely promising initiatives, which I just want to, to describe briefly, you know, the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center, the Australian Ocean Energy Group, and from our side, you know, the Wave Energy Research Center. So I'm going to cover that relatively briefly. So you, I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, launch of the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center um, um, now a year and a half ago. This is the largest cooperative research center in Australia. It's a 10 years program. Uh, uh, which aims to, uh, have a, to, to create a paradigm shift in how marine protein is produced, uh, uh, is needed now, so, and, and being scalable, sustainable, uh, and generating a scalable, sustainable and offshore aquaculture, sorry. So it's all driven actually by the end user, the aquaculture, and the need basically as the aquaculture is moving offshore to uh, generate a larger volume of fish production, how we are going to power 
this uh, aquaculture industry with sustainable and clean energy. So as I mentioned, it's a very, very large program, you know, with uh, uh, um, over 45 partners, and it's a 10 years program with over, 100, uh, um, with over $320 million of funding, both cash and in-kind uh, across the different partners. So it's a very significant program, um, and which is organized across five different research streams in offshore engineering technology, seafood and marine products, offshore renewable energy system, environment ecosystem and sustainable offshore development. And the key aspect of this program is that they don't run in silos, but basically all activities are actually integrated across the five programs in strong collaboration by the industry, which is actually leading the program to develop within 10 years, you know, this uh, growth in the aquaculture business uh, in a sustainable way. The second initiative is, uh, and, and uh, uh, Francois has mentioned it, is the Australian Ocean Energy Group, which I believe has been running for uh, three or four years now, and it's led by uh, Stephanie Fortin. Um, so the mission of the Australian, Australian Ocean Energy Group is to accelerate the commercialization of Australian ocean energy as the next frontier in low carbon generating capacity. And, and the idea is basically really to bring together all the different stakeholders uh, uh, and assist them in collaborate, innovate, engage with the different uh, uh, stakeholders and notably the government, inform and connect and be in a sense in the single voice in lobbying the different stakeholders about the potential of marine renewable energy and wave energy uh, in particular. And so it's organized as a cluster of SMEs, entrepreneurs, innovation, uh, intermediaries, universities, research institutions, investors, professional service agencies and governments. And, and I think it's a absolutely excellent and necessary initiative, you know, uh, uh, to support the development of the marine renewable energy technology in the country. And then the third initiative, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of uh, unshamed self-promotion here, it's about the Wave Energy Research Center that our group has created about four or five years ago, you know. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary research center, which is based in Albania, and I'll explain a bit more uh, why, and that is leveraging the expertise we've got in the Ocean Energy Group here, and that has been built over uh, three decades of uh, uh, working and interacting very closely with the oil and gas industry, and notably in all the oil and gas developments in the Northwest Shelf. So it's organized across three different research programs, one in oceanography and coastal processes, one in agrodynamics and wave structure interaction, and one in geotechnics and foundation design. It involves about uh, 30 uh, uh, staff, and, uh, and a similar number of PhD students and leverage as well experimental capabilities we've got uh, at the University of Western Australia, including geotechnical centrifuges, wave flume, and, uh, and in situ uh, uh, measurement. Um, why Albany? Uh, because uh, if you remember the map of uh, resources, you know we have here in Torbay, in the south of Western Australia, which is about 500 kilometers south of uh, uh, Albany, some of the uh, best resources in the world, you know, with about 50 kilowatts of power per meter and, and a ratio of extreme to uh, mean uh, wave, which is extremely favorable and ensure that we've got a continuous generation of power all year long uh, during all seasons. So we have deployed uh, uh, different uh, measuring uh, device and uh, AWACS, you know, at shallow and water depth and, uh, and deep water depth. And so we are providing these uh, measurements, you know, on our website live. And so this is accessible to everybody. And our group has done some significant modeling at a very high resolution of the wave climate in Torbay and progressively all along the Great Southern Coast. And so this is some, again, example of the data that are provided in, in our website and that we will be complementing as uh, the research progress with additional data. And so the center is fairly well connected internationally, and so we collaborate with uh, 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 several developers, including Clean Energy, Core Power, Rock, and, and N4 in the UK. And from an academic perspective, we're also engaging with multiple research centers and universities uh, all across the world. And so we have a very, very strong mandate of engaging with industry and supporting the development of offshore renewable energy you know, uh, in Australia uh, and worldwide and accelerating commercialization of uh, uh, this uh, uh, technology. So this is all for me. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions, of course. Thanks, Christoph.
Jan? Yeah, sure. I'll ask the question uh, if no one else is. Uh, look, thanks to all the presenters and Christoph as well. Really interesting. Um, you know, we've all been aware of the different things in wave energy. Uh, myself, I've been kind of aware, but not following closely. So it's nice to hear where we are. You know, one thing that I always understood is that that the mechanical issues of having machinery underwater is an issue. Um, you know, just the materials, the construction, the moving parts. If we kind of push through that, have we figured that out, or is that still a, an issue for especially wave power? Um, I've got two. I've got two answers for that. Yeah, the first one is that uh, um, there is there are technology, and so and the wave swell technology is one. You know, we are actually all the power generation is out of the water. You know, and this is the case of the M4 wave energy converter, for instance, as well. So, so, you, so there is existing technology where you don't have any submerged parts, you know, or at least not the intelligence, the power takeoff, you know, which is the important part, are actually above water. And um, now, a more a second answer, you know, which is a more generic one, is that uh, um, I've been working, you know, uh, over the last uh, two decades, you know, with the oil and gas industry, and I have accompanied the, the movement from shallow water to deep waters, you know. And I don't think that having a wave energy converter with submerged part is more challenging than developing subsea structures 3,000 meters deep, you know. And if we have been able to do that from a technological point of view, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to produce, you know, uh, the technology of wave energy converter, even with PTO that are submerged, when we, like this is the case, for example, with Carnegie Clean Energy, and I think which has a very, uh, you know, efficient system uh, with a submerged PTO, for instance. So for me, it's all about, you know, the effort and, and the will power we've got in pushing all of that forward. Interesting. Thanks for that. I think just to follow on this also, when we were talking about uh, the difference between wind and turbine in terms of density and, uh, for example, rotation speed, if you think about it, if we, if we think about, okay, a wind turbine at 2 megawatts that is rotating at let's say 60 rpm or, or 40 rpm the wind turbine is rotated at 5 rpm the wave device rated at 2 megawatt is rotating as you know it's a sweep let's say if it's rotating of 10 to 20 degrees over 15 seconds so one of the biggest challenge maybe is is also the fact that there's no really off the shelf solutions or or the each technology had to basically develop Technology that were orders of magnitude different than other renewable in terms of load and uh, and and basically ways of of uh, functioning and uh, and typically these are done by uh, relatively small small companies small engineering groups so yeah I think the the, the progress is uh, is promising but the the challenge are real. Okay, uh, Michael, maybe last question, please. Thank you very much. And Christophe and Francois, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, from Azura Wave Energy. We've been uh, working in the, uh, the space for about 14 years, with, primarily with the DOE uh, and uh, just through, through lack of local interest. We're at the commercialization stage and uh, using both the, the, the heave and swell, uh, not only now generating power, but also potable water from on board. Um, do you both feel there is the appetite within the Australian environment at, at, at the, the government level for wave energy? We just see in all the roadmaps, et cetera, that we, we get left. We left, and speaking on behalf, you know, the energy I work with Stephanie, and I love the wave swell device. It's, it's fantastic technology that we have so much great innovation going on, yet we seem to be slipping between the cracks. With all the you know the focus on hydrogen and offshore wind etc what what are your thoughts on that yeah that's a, that's a very that's an excellent question you know and I, I i think i want to be optimistic you know and i think the the, the last few years have been quite challenging you know covid situation apart but uh, um, at least in western australia uh, the state government is quite supportive of wave energy uh, because of personal interest and because there is a, a full understanding now of the potential and the capacity we've got in the state, we, you know, uh, the, the resources we've got. Uh, but also because actually the hydrogen agenda, which is at the forefront at the moment, you know, create opportunity. There is a very strong push for green hydrogen and understanding, you know, how this could basically be uh, achieved with wave and wind energy. So, so I don't think 
I, I don't think we 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 will enjoy the support of Europe and, and the US, but I think the situation is definitely to become uh, a bit more promising in the years to come. And I think the role that Stephanie and the Australian Ocean Energy Group is playing is fundamental, you know, and, and we start to get heard, you know, quite significantly. So I want to be optimistic. Thank you. So do we all. Yeah. As I said, there's some amazing innovative technology being developed, and we'd really like to keep that yeah. here in Australia locally and develop that whole yeah. industry around. So I'd, I'd be very happy to talk, you know, uh, uh, on a different channel and so have a conversation and see, you know, how we can with with all our stakeholders in Australia, you know, and see how we can we can assist. Will do. Thank you very much. All right, um, so we are past seven o'clock. Um, 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 I don't, personally, I don't have any time limit. Um, uh, if there is more questions, um, I'm happy to uh, uh, you to ask uh, Christophe, Francois, I, I'm, I'm not sure about your timelines. There is one more question, if you're happy, we answered that. Yeah. yeah. I'm in Perth, so it's only five o'clock for me. <laughs> Brian? Uh, Brian, you have a question? Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I was, I was just trying to unmute my microphone, so I wasn't used to that. Yes, um, look, it's Brian Bodecker here. I'm from I'm the environment manager at NSW Ports. Um, actually, my background's in oceanography, so I sort of have an appreciation for what's been discussed here tonight and also the challenges. Um, I'm, I'm as, as part of what NSW Ports is looking at is how we could be a player in um, the renewable energy game and, and, and obviously being located on, you know, ocean shorelines um, with breakwaters and other infrastructure already in place, um, seeing what, what potential there is there. And I, and I guess I come to your comment first, Christoph, that in terms of the challenges, and that is end user acceptance. And, you know, I speak to a few people and it's like, no, wave energy has no future. It's unreliable. It's in a harsh environment. It can't succeed. There's been, and, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Port Kembla, there was a wave energy project quite a few years ago, um, which ended up becoming an obstruction in the harbour when it broke loose. And it didn't do the industry <laughs> a lot of favours. Um, so there's a bit of scepticism and reluctance. So, so the question I have to that is, you know, can you see how we might be able to build some end user confidence overcoming those previous hurdles? What would be a pathway for, I guess, engaging in end users that, you know, that may wish to look at doing something a bit innovative, a bit, you know, leading edge? Um, you know, we have developments coming up at the port. Um, I, I don't think um, Tom Dennis is here. I did want to ask him the same question. I think there's, you know, the breakwater in, in initiatives. I think when you can have your wave energy captured with the least moving parts below the water, you've, you're, you're getting onto something, uh, keeping that cost of uh, maintenance and, and the, the reliability factors up. I'm, I'm looking at a couple of projects, another one that I find quite interesting, which wasn't really bridged on tonight, which is the Eco Wave Power, the Portugal project, uh, Gibraltar, sorry, Gibraltar, not Portugal, Gibraltar, and um, also Port of Jaffa. Um, I, I just wonder, do you have comments on that one? I, I look at it and it looks, it, it, the, the engineering me says it's beauty simplicity, but um, I, I'd no, like no, to hear absolutely. you. Um, Francois, are you happy for me to start? Or are you? Yes, yes, please. That's, I, I think I've, yeah. I've put a couple of so, questions. No, I, I think you're totally right and I agree with you. And I think there is two aspects of it. I mean, the first thing is that the, the industry needs a success story, you know, I mean, to basically break that circle of, of mistrust and, and no confidence. And I think it's, it is coming. Uh, uh, West Wales story is fantastic. You know, I mean, the deployment is successful. And so that's going to, to help. Uh, Core Power is developing in Portugal uh, next year, you know, uh, and a fairly large device. And so we all hope this is going to be successful. Bompora has their development in the uh, Pembrokeshire and so then uh, after in Spain. If we can go through these different successes, you know, I think that's going to help a lot raising the confidence uh, in the technology. So I think we just need to hope, you know, for a full success uh, uh, on all of this. 
And the second aspect is, uh, is uh, end user engagement. And, and I think what the blue economy CRC is doing is, is absolutely fundamental. You know, it's bringing the aquaculture industry into the party and having them driving, you know, uh, uh, the, the questions and the, and the problems uh, uh, and engaging with uh, with the renewable energy industry, you know, to solve these problems. So I think I think it is happening. It is happening, but it has been slow in the process. Uh, and and again, just to repeat a bit what I've mentioned previously, you know, I, I want to be optimistic. Uh, we we start. I personally, I started about five years ago. You know, uh, um, uh, again, I, I'm a geotechnical engineer. I use a, I worked a lot for the oil and gas industry. I started about five years ago and I was extremely excited about the potential uh, here in Australia and in Western Australia with all these SMEs, a very dynamic network of SMEs, uh, um, you know, these resources that are fantastic, an expertise, you know, in the industry, in ocean engineering and in research, which was world leading because of all the oil and gas development. So that was extremely exciting. And then we went through that trough, you know, where basically things were moving very slowly and I could see my my counterpart in the US, you know, the director of the Pacific Wave Energy Research Center, receiving significant subsidies and, and, and having a lot of momentum where we were struggling with that. So I thought we were suddenly lagging behind. But now I think we are actually turning the corner and so things are going to be more uh, promising in the, in the near future. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I, I, I like to share your optimism. Um, and I, I, as I say, I'm, I'm I do feel like I'm <laughs> pu push, pushing water up a very steep hill with a very pointy yeah, stick. Um, I've, yeah. used the word, I've used the word water rather than the typical colloquialism that we use, but <laughs> for politeness. But yeah, I, I think I my next step will be to en engage with the um, Ocean Energy Group and see, you know, uh, see absolutely. How, and see how, as I say, I think as, as a port with a commitment to be a green port and a commitment to look at, at, at green energy, there, there could be some opportunities there. Um, I mean, but they, they would have to be, I'd be very, very cautious in recommending anything to my, to my superiors. I'd like to, you know, rate its chances of success quite highly. Uh, I think, Ryan, you're, you're perfectly right in this terms of, I think it's all about managing expectation and mm -hmm. also not over promising. And in the last, you know, 20 years, there were clear cases of, uh, of developers over promising because that was the only way for them to survive because of yep. the nature of the funding game yes. and, and i would say this obviously was initiative like the crc or the the wave energy center is is giving a bit of certainty and stability for for developers to to focus on what they should be focusing and not necessarily like if you think about australia for some of the deployments the deployer had to Look at the consenting, putting the offshore cable, things like this. Things that, in a way, the small startup that was looking at the device was not, that was not the core business or expertise. So uh, I think in Australia, the the game was pretty hard compared to, uh, for example, Northern Europe. Uh, but the other thing, as you being a representative of, of really important end users, is is also integrating the end users as early as possible. If you look at you know, the port infrastructure and two examples of, of fixed uh, wave energy conversion technology integrated into coastal infrastructure, either the Mutriku breakwater or the, uh, the EcoPower in, uh, in Gibraltar. Is, I would say the EcoPower in a way, it's, it's great that it retrofits, but is this more just the case that that's the only places where they could use and it's not, it's not ideal. So I think that if, if end users can provide also opportunity and infrastructure to some extent access to, to best infrastructure and even at early stages, like if they're planning and they're saying, oh, we're going to upgrade or break water, let's start from the beginning. Let's let's have a dedicated case on for that. And there are initiative in Italy where they're doing this. I think the change of success and positive example will, will be increased. I have to, I have to say Tom's, uh, Tom Dennis's uh, projects with had the caught my ear because we the Port Kembla breakwaters are non-engineered breakwaters with uh, armor armor units that do require replenishment every every few years and and I could certainly see if you can turn your breakwater into a money earner I mean that's got to <laughs> that's certainly got to catch the ear of a few board members I think <laughs> what our breakwater will make money not cost us money yeah that that, <laughs> that I have to say that. It, uh, 
it almost seems too good to be true and I'm going to hold that position until I do a lot more research first and make some inquiries and watch very very keenly what's happening on um, uh, King Island down in Tasmania but, but certainly uh, that shows a lot of promise I think from that perspective and I loved I loved I loved its simplicity and that uh, no moving parts underwater and I think they nailed it there as well um, in terms of the, the chances of commercial success also the other thing that he, he mentioned the construction on concrete and uh, we've just done at Port Kembla some a couple of years ago trials with uh, the CRC for low carbon living and did uh, uh, non cement concrete armor blocks using um, waste slag, blast furnace slag, and fly ash. Um, and so there are opportunities to be truly renewable in terms of the construction materials as well um, by using, you know, what is currently seen as a as a waste product from the power industry or the or the steel industry. So, you know, I. I as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it and where, where possible participate and, and, and uh, in the debates and discussions like tonight. So thank you for both of you and, and to Tom um, for, for presentations. I found it incredibly informative. Thank you very much. Uh, you're most welcome. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Christophe, uh, Francois. Um, um, I hope everyone found the presentations informative. I personally uh, uh, found them. Um, just just before we all go um, on uh, the future events that we'll have, uh, my colleagues in uh, the New South Wales chapter, um, they uh, they are organizing a few events. One of them it will be on cruise industry in Australia. Um, everybody. Uh, uh, knows what's happening now and and, and and it looks like an industry that is going to have a hard time uh, starting again. Um, so that that's that will be an interesting subject and discussion. Um, you will get a notification on timing and details. Uh, uh, that's in the planning. Um, um, there are more events. If you just refer to the Piank uh, website, uh, there is a Greenport Live Australia driving the principles of a sustainability. I think it's planned for 1st of sept September and we'll have a YP event at the end of the year. Um, the, um, the other event that I would like to mention is that I think um, Engineers Australia COPEP will have an event um, later this month. Um, and if you like the details, you can just find the details on Engineers Australia website. Thank you very much for joining and hope that uh, you enjoyed the uh, presentations. Thanks, Christophe, and thanks, Francois. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Shahab. Thank you. Thank you.